if you want this strategic referral partnership, which by the way, has the ability to send you one or two warm referrals a month, then get to work, be resourceful. Who do you know who might know? You're one or two introductions away from solving everybody's problems who has them. So get resourceful and bring value to the business without expecting anything in return. Once they're extremely appreciative and they recognize, number one, you were introduced differently. Number two, you were you came in the meeting and talked about me, not you. Number three, you followed up with value. The final step is to add value to their clients through them. You found the Real Estate Law Podcast because real estate is more than just pretty pictures and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. If you're a real estate professional or looking to build real estate expertise, then welcome to the conversation and discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Law Podcast. It's another great episode that we think is a great episode, Rory. Uh, we have an awesome guest on, and you know we're really excited to be talking to Justin Stoddard out in Portland, Oregon, because he has so many great things to say with all the work he does coaching agents and as a former real estate investor or current real estate investor himself. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about what's happening with his coaching teams of people that he works with and all the agents that help him out understanding what's happening in their worlds and spheres of influence. Rory, I know that your agents come to you for lots of questions, especially in a crazy environment that we're here having in the first and second quarters of 2023, right? Yep. And I hope all of my agents are listening to this podcast, especially if they want to grow their business in a market where we always need to be really thinking ahead, You know, not what's happening right now, but what comes next. And if you're an agent elsewhere, you should be listening to this one too. Well, let me introduce Justin officially. Uh, Justin is the CEO and head coach of Think Bigger Real Estate. You're a former land developer and home builder, and you specialize in helping real estate agents grow warm market leads by building strategic referral partnerships with other professionals like attorneys and CPAs and insurance agents and whatnot. And I can't wait to hear more about that. But Justin, please, warm welcome to the Real Estate Law Podcast. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Great to be here with you. Really, yeah. really appreciate the work that you do. And uh, it's fun to be be here with you today. I should say you're a podcast host yourself too, right? I am. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah one of my favorite good. things. Outside of being a dad, I, I think interviewing great people like you guys is probably at the top of the list. Yeah. You have an awesome background right there too. If you're listening to this, you don't have the opportunity to see the simplicity of Justin's background. And you know, we're... I'm in a jungle right here. <laughs> Rory is our podcast studio downstairs. I love the wall paneling, love the logo. Great professional look you got there. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So Justin, what's happening in your world today? I mean, we're recording this in the first quarter of 2023. Lots has been going on in the news with banking and real estate across the country. You're working with agents and you're coaching them. They're probably coming to you with lots of questions about how to improve their business because things are just not like what they used to be. So what are you hearing out there from some of your coaching clients? You know, what we're seeing is that the casual buyers and sellers that are oftentimes uh, coming into the market in the spring are sitting on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. A phrase that oftentimes our, our agents are hearing more often than they like to hear, which is, you know what, we're going to wait and see what happens. In fact, I just had a client yesterday. Uh, I was talking to her. She said, I had a, a client that was ready to write a million dollar offer. And he decided he was going to just hold off because of what's been happening with the banking situation. And prior mm -hmm. to that, it, it was a very common conversation for people to be saying of like, you know, there's a lot going on with inflation. There's a lot going on with rates a lot going on in Europe, right? I mean, there's just, I think we're just going to wait. I think people just, when, whenever they feel unsettled, they stop and they don't, they don't take risks. They just want to hold their money tight. They just want to not do anything crazy. And uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty going on right now, that's, that's the market that we're in. And so, and that coupled with really, with the raise of interest rates last year, sellers are really still in love with and attached to last year's equity. And buyers are really attached to last year's buying power. And those two are not on the same plane right now. And so that happens in every shift, but this one was drastic in part because rates jumped so quickly that it's just taking longer for sellers to come back down to where it's kind of more of an equilibrium and buyers to come up to what their new kind of buying power is. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're seeing that um, agents who in previous years in this spring market right now we're selling X number of homes, you know, they're, they're X divided by two, some of them X divided by three, right? I've had a number of, of people tell me I haven't sold a home. This is so weird. I haven't sold a home in, in six months. And so I think that's, that's the reality that many agents are facing and not all agents. Some agents are, are 
doing just fine, maybe not doing as well as they'd like to, but they're doing okay. Um, and so the, the overall landscape is, is that I am, I am going to have to really take a look at how I'm getting business because it's not going to just come to me. It's going to be intentional. Uh, it's a skill-based market. I'm going to have to be uh, very good at, I, I can't pass over the times that I'm supposed to be proactively generating new business. I can't just shrug my shoulders and say, oh, I'll get to that tomorrow. Like it's no longer a nicety. It's a necessity. We have to be very intentional about growing our businesses right now. Mm-hmm. And we only have you for a short time. So I really kind of want to jump into that. If like any agent, if they're struggling to have kind of a lot of that easy business that was coming to us in the past few years, what can we be doing to really um, be more intentional about finding the business that's going to come next and feed our families? I love that topic, Roy. I appreciate you asking it because. The traditional models tell us that we build a big database and from that database will come uh, a smaller number of referrals, right? To the tune of about 10%, let's say. So let's say a warm market sphere-based business, if properly nurtured, should produce about a 10% return. In other words, 100 people in a database, well-nurtured, should produce about 10 deals a year, right? And that's statistically across the board. Some are higher, some are lower, but you could kind of expect on that. Now, in, in a year like this, it might be closer to... Um, like a, a 7% return, right? Maybe even a, f- a 5% return. So we have to take a look at, okay, what I, I can either settle for less and adjust my business expenses and lifestyle expenses accordingly, which is not a bad idea to do. But there's another way where you don't have to necessarily settle. And I think that's that's the magic of, of what we're teaching right now and the great results we're helping agents to get. And if you were to take a look at at that situation where maybe a 10% return on a database has turned into a 5 to 7% return on a database. Rather than saying, well, I guess I just need to grow my database bigger and bigger and bigger and have more conversations and work harder and put food on the table, but not be there at the dinner table when it's served, right? Which is reality for many real estate agents, especially in this market is like, mm-hmm. I just got to put food on the table, but sorry, kids, sorry, sweetheart. I'm not going to be there to enjoy it with you. And sometimes we've got to do what we got to do, Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I I commend anybody that does that, but I'm going to give you a perspective right now that will cause you to maybe rethink this a little bit is that that scenario, the the working the additional long hours and having more and more conversations is based on the fact that we know that we're having to sort through more people to find the highly motivated, right? Those that are highly motivated to buy or sell this year. We just have to have more conversations to find those that are not casual buyers and sellers, but are the, the real like need to buy, need to sell buyers and sellers. So what if rather than, and I'll compare a typical database to a, a bale of hay, right? And in there, we know that there are needles, right? It's like needle in a haystack. There are people who have to buy, have to sell. They're in there somewhere. So what do I do? I got to go sort through more hay and maybe look through more hay to find the needles. That's, that's what traditional thinking tells us. Um, however, what I would recommend is rather than, than taking that route, Uh, why don't we just go looking for stacks of needles instead of looking for more bales of hay to find the needles? What if we just identified a way to where are the stacks of needles? It's not the hay that I want. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we've got in our head that if, if I want needles then I got to go find hay and it's, that's not necessarily the case. We want the needles. So how do we go find the needles? Mm -hmm. And here's what this metaphor means is that there are highly motivated buyers and sellers in this market. And oftentimes those that are highly motivated is because they're going through some sort of life transition that's forcing their hand to be highly motivated in this market. Because if you have the luxury to wait, sure, why not? Let's just see what happens, right? But if by chance you're going through what I call any one of the eight Ds, call it divorce, right? You might not have the luxury to continue to live in that same house for a while, right? Diamonds, right? You just, you're forming a new household, We're getting more serious about life, right? Diapers. You just added a new baby. We don't have room. I'm working from home and I've got a new baby here. This isn't going to work. We need a bigger home, right? Somebody passes away. Mom can't stay in that house by herself anymore. We got to sell the house, right? Devastation, right? In which maybe somebody loses a job. That's happening, right? Um, We have people who maybe it's some sort of natural disaster, right? Like devastation forces the hand. You know, some of the other ones include uh, like, New destination, right? People moving from cold Boston down to sunny Florida, right? Mm -hmm. So there's any number of of things that are moving people to be highly motivated in this market. And that's the reality of housing. The beautiful thing is housing and shelter is not going out of style. However, people casually buying real estate, that is out of style for the moment. So we have to, again, hone in on the people that are 
really focused, really motivated in this market. And so in, in other words, I, I would compare those people to being stacks of needles. Well, how do we, like, where are these stacks hanging out? Well, if we say, I'm going to focus on people who are going through a divorce, then you could go find a strategic referral partner of being a divorce mediator or you know, a family law attorney, right? If you're talking about people who are, let's say they're you know, diamonds, kind of using that, that, that D, right? People who are wedding planners, uh, diapers, or people who do birthing classes, right? These okay. are professionals whose businesses deal with people right around a life transition. And as a result, you can rest assured that they're dealing with a lot of people who are going to be needing to buy, needing to sell. So again, rather than looking through the masses, looking for the needles of haystacks, let's just go right to the people that already have the relationships who are dealing with people that are going to need that now. All those connections you know, are critically important for this. How can somebody get a connection or actually I should say, how can an agent provide value to somebody who's in one of those professions instead of just approaching them as a prospective taker of their business? Yeah, I love that, Rory. You've, you've actually identified some very key points as to why this oftentimes does not work very well. It's because real estate agents, even though they may be very friendly and have beautiful cards and have a great mm-hmm. elevator pitch, when they show up to get, even in some of the kindest language that has been invented for real estate agents, like, oh, by the way, I'm never too busy for your referrals. There's nothing wrong with that line when it's people who already love you. But when you're Mm -hmm. approaching a new professional, it's nice and it may work for your sphere, but it's not designed to work for a business owner. And they know right away that you're there to get something just like every other real estate agent, you know, that has maybe come in the door to solicit their business as well. And that's exactly who you are is you're a solicitor because you're there to get something. Your question is uber wise because in order for this to work, it can't be about getting something. Because if so, you'll go to the back of the line behind the 10 or 12 other real estate agents that they already know, which means this isn't going to be a like a really viable option for you to generate business now. The perspective needs to be exactly what you described, which is with the ultimate goal being of how do I make it so easy to refer me? It's almost as easy as breathing. Like it just it just falls out of their mouth because they're already talking about me in their existing client meetings. Like I've made it to where real estate is coming up in their meetings. And when you start to think, okay, how do I reverse engineer that? How do I work backwards from that? It is exactly, you have to seek a warm introduction. In fact, from day one, you need them from the very first contact or the first time they hear about you, they need, it needs to tr- trigger in their mind that this is not the, this is not a common real estate agent. And so what, what we teach is to first and foremost, be intentional about who is the person that you want to be serving. The ideal avatar could be a senior, right? A senior citizen. It could be a first time home buyer. It could be somebody relocating to a new destination. Identify who is the person that you are uniquely set up to serve. Once you have that person identified, then identify who is the professional that already has a relationship with that person. So that I don't have to go out and try and find those people. I just go to the stacks and needles where they're already hanging out. And then you seek a warm introduction to that person. So you're not going to solicit in. And the introduction is going to be crafted by you. In other words, you're going to, you're going to give us some bullet points, very similar to how I gave you guys some bullet points on here's Justin and here's who we're interviewing today. I didn't leave that up to you. So it's like, well, Justin's a, a guy that has something to share with us, right? Which you guys are more intelligent than to introduce me like that. You sought out for me, give us some, some bio points. Very similarly, you're going to give the person who's introducing you some bio points so that the audience hears about you in the best possible frame. And so, uh, depending upon, upon who you're talking to, you want to craft that to where when they say, oh, interesting, this, this doesn't even sound like a common real estate agent, right? Some of the phrases we like to use is, this is a wealth advisor for your real estate portfolio, right? This is someone who helps manage your wealth in real estate. This is someone who helps grow people's wealth through real estate. When all of a sudden you're being introduced to a financial advisor, for example, in that way, they're like, huh. That's interesting. I want to meet this person. Like, like that kind of sounds like what I do, right? But in real estate, that's interesting. So now, all of a sudden, from the very onset of this of this introduction, you sound different. When you show up in that meeting, which is step three of our model, show up in that meeting, you are showing up not to deliver your cards and your dog and pony show and say, you know, I'm not like I'm never too busy for your referrals. You, you're there to take off the real estate agent hat and put on the business consultant hat. You're there to learn about their business. First and foremost, you want to see if there's somebody who you could integrate into your practice. If there's somebody who you could talk about frequently to your clients. Like, do they fit the bill? If not, right, um, then of course it's a short meeting. But if they are, you're there to listen for challenges that they're having in their business. Like, 
Where are they at? Where are they headed? What's their plan to get there? What bottlenecks are you experiencing? And, and you're looking for ways that you can leverage your network and your knowledge to add value to the business. And so the day after the meeting, you're following up saying, hey, I heard what you said yesterday about having difficulty in finding and keeping good paralegals. I have someone in my network that actually uh, works to, to find paralegals for people. Is it okay if I make an introduction, right? Now you might be saying like, well, I don't know if I know how to do that. If you want this strategic referral partnership, which by the way, has the ability to send you one or two warm referrals a month, then get to work, be resourceful. Who do you know who might know? You're one or two introductions away from solving everybody's problems who has them. So get resourceful and bring value to the business without expecting anything in return. Mm -hmm. Once they're extremely appreciative and they recognize, number one, you were introduced differently. Number two, you you came in the meeting and talked about me, not you. Number three, you followed up with value. The final step is to add value to their clients through them. So one thing that real estate agents have an uncanny ability to do is to create a current comparative market analysis for people. And when you give that information to a financial advisor, they're able to better serve their clients. They want to talk about real estate. That way their clients don't go buy real estate without telling them. They don't go sell real estate without telling them. And you can actually arm them and equip them with the ability to talk about real estate in every one of their annual reviews, which ought to be happening about one per day, by the way, one to two Mm -hmm. per day in the average financial advisor's database. You can imagine how many real estate related conversations they're having. And and oh, by the way, you don't have to say, oh, by the way, because your CMA is in that meeting with them. You're there in the meeting with them to where you you don't have to, it's not hard to get a referral from that person anymore because when they mention, you know, we're thinking we're going to sell a couple of rental properties and you know, roll that into a, you know, an Airbnb asset, you know, at that coastal town where we, you know, want to spend some time as a family. You've already done the work on the couple of rental property. Like, well, here's somebody who who already has some some knowledge about the property. There's someone who at least you should talk to. That came from their financial advisor, right? And that's a that's a much better endorsement than an online lead where three other people are seeing who can call them back mm-hmm. the fastest. That's not that's the world where margins and autonomy go away. And that's where most real estate agents are like, I don't want to do this anymore. Or, or we, we, we don't get a really high professional group of people, right? We get people who, who are just solicitors. And so they get treated like solicitors. And we wonder why our margins are being compressed. It's because we're, being, because we're, we're acting in the same way that we are asking to be treated. And so if we really want to show up as professionals, get paid as professionals, then we ought to maybe get introduced from other professionals and, and add the kind of value that other professionals would, ha- would add. And, and that's really the path to, to having a referral flow to clients in this market who are highly motivated to buy and sell to where you don't have to settle your numbers and say, well, I guess I'll just settle for less. I hope the market gets better next year, right? You don't have to have that conversation. You can say, okay, what do I need to learn? Who do I need to become? And what strategic referral partners do I need to add the significant value to in order to produce that referral flow to those that, that, that will make a move this year? It's such an interesting perspective and way to think about the real estate agent's world because there's so much noise out there. You know, we all see it on social media from the bad agents that are all they're doing is they're posting what they sold, what their listings are, and asking for referrals. And, you know, they're they're kind of leaning on their local expertise, which today seems pretty lazy frankly, right? Oh, I'm your expert in this zip code. Okay. Well, how is that different from the other 50 agents that are experts in that zip code? And and Justin, what you started talking about is a way of setting agents apart. I could see some agents getting nervous because, you know, if you become the specialist in X, you know, maybe you're not the specialist in Y or Z anymore. It might be the way their mind goes because people try to harness all the leads, right? Like I could I could be a generalist. I could do everything. But, you know, in, in in a pure marketing sense, you know, it's really good to specialize on one thing than be a generalist in many things and really serve nobody. So that kind of leads to a question. Like, you know, you do a lot of great coaching, you know, with Think Bigger. The types of people that are contacting you, you know, are they, do they know they need your services? Do they know they need your coaching and some of your wisdom as to how to really set them up for for good lead flow? for a good year, or do they have no idea they need your service or somewhere in between? Who do you hear from and who are kind of your best clients? I would say those that heard what I just share right there. If it's like, oh my goodness, 
I would love to work almost in like in a, in a B2B environment. Maybe they've come out of a corporate world. Maybe they've come out of some sort of professional field. And they've always been a little bit uncomfortable of, not uncomfortable, but they've longed for those conversations again, right? Where they can leverage the power of their professional network to grow, yet they're serving people in their houses. And so they don't, they haven't really leveraged their professional network or even just their skills in dealing in a professional setting. Um, those are the people that are really like, oh man, I like this model because this is kind of my DNA. I love having strategy conversations. I love connecting people. I love solving problems in business. I'm kind of a business person. I just happen to be in the business of real estate, residential real estate. This typically resonates with them. And they're like, how do I do this? Because I would love to have not, not only just the benefits of what you described, but I'd actually like to have my day-to-day be having conversations with an insurance agent and a lender and an attorney and a financial advisor and adding value to their clients through them. That's, that's, that's kind of my jam, right? And that's, that's really why, why this originally worked for me as a high-end home builder is I really enjoyed not just soliciting business from the consumer, but I really enjoyed creating strategic referral partnerships that work. So usually when people hear um, some component of what I just shared, they're like, Ooh, I want to learn more. Right. And then there's always some curiosity of like, how do you actually help people to do that? Right. What, what does that actually look like? So at that point, it becomes kind of a kind of a, a um, an alignment of of is the help that I offer how they receive the help? Like is that what they're looking for? And then we walk down that path together. And sometimes I'll say, I don't I don't think this is the right fit for you. I think you're really looking for something else. Um, I'll give a recommendation, you know, to some other coaches that really do that. I really I, I call myself a, a a coach, but more what I do is I'm a trainer and I have a very unique model that allows people to shift to a B2B lead generation model in a B2C world. And um, I teach and train that and help install that in your business in three months. And if you want to stay stay in our community can, to continue to refine that and get better at it, great. But you'll have what you need to know. The systems will be installed to where you can make that pivot in in in, in one quarter. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, there's a, a time, place, and purpose for online leads and even cold leads. Um, but what I like about the approach of having kind of the warm introductions isn't just the conversion rate, but the relationship you have uh, between the professional and the client. Um, yeah. It's rooted in trust. The conversations are a little bit more advanced, at least in my experience. And you're not always trying to build that little bit of trust as you're getting going with um, the the relationship. So for you know all my agents out there, I'd encourage them to make this more central to their practice just because it, I've always found it to be more rewarding to work with those clients who start the relationship with an element of trust. Yeah. And I think you've hit the nail on the head, Rory, is that you're you're not having to build the trust yourself because that trust is being transferred through a powerful introduction, right? Yeah. Through an endorsement. You have to say endorsement lightly because some of these like financial professionals have to be care- careful yeah. about endorsing. But if they say, this is a professional who we've partnered with to get information about your property, they're great. There's someone at least you should talk to. That's not an endorsement, but it's an introduction with, even though they're covering themselves a little bit there, I'm saying like, here's somebody you should talk to amongst others, right? If that helps them to feel like they're, at least from a liability standpoint, that, that, they're, that they're covered, that even just the fact that that you're their partner to bring this information into this meeting, there's so much trust that gets transferred just, just through that that you're not one of many anymore, right? You're really one of one. It's yours to lose in my opinion, right? Unless that person is either deeply related to or has a deep, deep relationship with another great agent. Like you are in first place when their advisor who they've trusted with was so much says, this is who we've partnered with. You know, you should at least talk to them. Um, It's yours to lose, right? Which is very different than the online lead space, right? Very different where you're trying to do anything you can to get trust and become likable. And and it's very much a, you're a, you're on call, like, and you better be there, like, at the speed of the ambulance, because uh, somebody else will if you won't. And I don't know you from Adam, so I'm going to cause you to open up a few doors, and I'm going to keep kicking some tires. And I don't even feel bad if you left your family on Sunday night dinner because I wanted to see this house now. And on the website, it says that's what you do. So sorry, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you can exit out of that world and stop having planet world. Which right now, many are saying. My warm market sphere isn't producing at the level I want to. So I don't have an option. I got to go into that world, but they hate it and they want out of it. And this is a path for them to come back into the warm market and get better and more referrals, not just leads, but referrals, but more scalable, right? Because again, the average database produces at 10%. 
a great referral partner will produce it a thousand percent. And what I mean by that is again, a hundred people or 10 people to, to produce one referral per year, right? Whereas the right upstream partner, which is what I reference them as the right strategic partner, it's one partner to produce 10 referrals, mm-hmm. right? It's such a higher conversion rate and just a better use of time. How do you get clients of yours to think differently and maybe move out of their comfort zone of what they're used to doing and whether or not what they're used to doing is successful to move into a system that you're proposing? A lot of it happens as they hear the stories of other people, right? So I'll, I'll tell a couple. I have a client right now, his name's Daniel, and uh, Daniel um, had a rough 2022, as many agents, rougher than he would have liked. And uh, he, he came and he said, Justin, I don't... I can't give you all the credit for this, but your, your program has had a significant impact upon me and, and upon my business. And um, to the tune of, I will have made more money by March 15th, which was two days ago from this recording, than I did all of last year. Keep in mind, he had a rough last year, mm-hmm. but he's, he's a great producing agent. And he said, now some of that would have happened already just because the pipeline was delayed a little bit because of interest rates. But he said, I've switched my conversations to be from the masses to the few but the few who can really help me. And so when people hear, hear stories, right? And, and I mean, another one already, now sometimes we think of just the professional crowd, right? People who, who are dealing with CPAs and attorneys and so many people are intimidated. They're like, ah, I don't know if I can have those conversations. I have some people that, some agents that are very unsophisticated and one in three weeks got two slam dunk listings from an HVAC contractor. Mm-hmm. I have another group um, out, out of Idaho that has, has teamed up with, you know, what I call a strategic referral partner of a moving company like I didn't know this, but she uncovered it, that oftentimes people will get a bid on what it's going to cost to move before they ever go move, right? Before they mm-hmm. actually list their home, they want to see what it's going to cost. And so people are, are, are having these conversations, uh, you know, consumers are having conversations with these people before they go talk to real estate agents. So sometimes it's just helping people to see there's all different tiers of people around, that are right around a real estate transaction. Mm-hmm. And if you just spend your time Building real value, as Rory described, real value for that one or two people, it can it can change everything. So typically, when people start hearing those stories, they're like, "Okay, this is way better than pumping money into Facebook or, you know, giving lead gen source thirty five percent of my of my income." You know, it's yeah. just a better path. Before we start to wrap up and get to the final questions, I want to ask about your book because you're also an author, the Upstream Model, and. Uh, I'd like to find out what a couple of those hidden secrets are uh, into building the massive referral business while crushing the big tech competitors. That's part of your title. Yeah. Appreciate you asking. So the principles we've been talking about are, some of them are in the book, like the foundational way of thinking is that's what the book's about. And so, um, you know, some of the, some of the, the, or the way that I uncovered it, again, I was a land developer, high-end home builder working for another gentleman. He decided his passion was really land development. And he began to, to pursue that heavily. And he put me to oversee his custom home business. And there came a point where it just didn't make sense to, to have him in the equation. And he knew it. I knew it. And um, so we parted ways with his blessing. And I just assumed that it was going to be just as easy to go develop new business as he had made it appear up to that point. And I quickly realized, as many real estate agents recognize, is like, oh, I got my license. It looked really easy on HGTV. Or last year, 2020, 2021 were pretty easy. But all of a sudden, like, this is a very crowded shoreline. There's 1.6 million agents in a projected 4.5 million transactions. Each agent's going to close a couple of deals. That's not going to work, right? How's this going to pan out? And people start to realize like, ooh, this is crowded. And that's what I felt like as a builder. I felt like there were more builders than there were homes. And so I realized I could, I could kind of stay down at the bottom of the stream, uh, hence the, the name uh, upstream model. I could stay down at the bottom of the stream and, and really look for scraps and, and, and or try and do it for less and have it be a race to the bottom. Or I recognize that there was somebody else in the marketplace who was not a direct competitor, but who was, it was building relationships with those people just before they needed a builder. And that was an architectural designer. So in the book, I, I lay out the principles that I learned first and foremost in doing it wrong, right? As showing up as a solicitor or even just as a common vendor, and then how to actually build value for somebody else who has great potential to help me in a big way. And how I built out these strategic referral partnerships that changed my business and changed the way I think and, and look at business now. 
mm-hmm. to where it's not about chasing the masses anymore. It's really about finding a few key partners that can open the door to my ideal clients. And so the book outlines that and gives a number of principles, not just on that, but on how to how to step into being a leader that's attractive to these other professional partners. Because it's not a matter of just learning a few scripts that can help you get going. But there's also kind of a bigger shift that happens when you you go from being a vendor, which is just someone in your industry, like a real estate agent, to being a peer of these partners, and then to being a mentor and a leader to them, to where they need you in their business more than you need them. So it walks through how to make that, how to start that transition and, and how to keep it going to where you become someone that all, all your ideal strategic partners seek out and want to have in their business. How long have you been at this? Like where you officially transitioned into the um, Think Bigger think bigger part of the business? Yeah. So I, I began coaching. Uh, I was actually in the, um, after the building industry, did what it did in 2009. Um, I realized my passion really wasn't building homes, uh, nor was it even developing land. It was, it, it was a great business, right? But when the market shifted um, suddenly, I realized I, like, I don't want to develop land. I want to develop people. I don't want to build homes. I want to build businesses. So I was in the title and escrow industry actually for um, a number of years. And in there is where I really caught, it caught my attention that, that I really wanted to serve professionals. I wanted to serve the real estate industry. And, uh, and so um, it was actually just officially a little over a year ago that I, I left um, kind of an, an executive role inside of a title company, very um, cushy position to go pursue my passion, which is, is really this, helping p- people to develop themselves and build their businesses. Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a limitless amount of people that could uh, stand to gain some wisdom from, you know, conversations with you, Justin, and, you know, you have a great podcast. Uh, think the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. Is that right? Did I get yeah, the name right? right? Yeah. yeah. We'll make sure we link to that in the show notes, along with a link to the book and your website and everything. Uh, let's get to the final couple of questions we ask of all of our guests, just to uh, wrap up the conversation and get to know you a little bit more. And then we'll uh, make sure that you could uh, mention where they, that you could be found easily. First of these questions is if you can get on stage for a half an hour, and talk about any subject in the world does not have to be about what you do for a living. Uh, what would that be? Be my family. I'm married to a super a superhero, and together we have six children. And um, I could take if I had 30 minutes, that would give me about five minutes for each child, and that wouldn't be near enough. But uh, I'm I position my life to where I can be at, at their games and at, at their events. Yesterday I was at a a play for my two grade school age kids, and then the day before that I was at a track meet and a tennis match for my two kids. So or, or my my um, high school age kids. So um, family is really the kind of the center of, of, of my world. And um, part of what I see, as I mentioned before, is that I've sought out a business model, meaning the upstream model that allows me to not only put food on the table, but allows me to be at the table when the food is served. Right. And of course that's a, mm-hmm. that's a metaphor, but I think that's important is because there's a lot of people out there that will work their face off to put food on the table. And I commend that there's, that's, there's something very deeply noble about that, but if showed another, uh, shown another way, they could be there present as well. And I think that's at the, at the end of the day, that's what's going to matter the most is the, the impact and time we spent with those we love the most. So, so that's what I would talk about as, as family and how you can actually have a life where you can have both. You don't have to choose. You don't have to be a pauper and a good dad. You could be both, right? Or mm-hmm. a good mom. You, you can be both. Your secret must be you have a double or a triple, you know, the <laughs> doppelganger or whatever the term is for the third version of that. Uh, if mm-hmm. you have to go to all those different events, I mean, what happens when all six have a sporting event or a play on the same day? You know, my wife's super wise. As I mentioned, I, I was fortunate to marry up in every sense of the word. And um, she's pretty strategic about how she she organizes uh, life and sports. And um, oftentimes we'll have three kids in the pool at the same time. She was a swimmer and uh, she was a she was a, a state champion uh, um, track and field athlete. And so she's, okay, our kids, she, she gets them to fall in love with the sports that she loved, which is pretty strategic. <laughs> And they're all kind of grouped together to where we can typically watch a couple of kids at the same time. But uh, yeah. yeah, sometimes we can't, right? And that's just the yeah. reality of, of life. We got to pick and choose our favorites for the day and then make it up to the other ones on the next day. So strategic parenting. There we go. I like it. Uh, second question that we have, tell us something that happened early in your life or career that impacts the way that you're working today. Yeah. I love it. This just came to mind. So when I was a kid, I had a, a really bad stuttering problem maybe we've all been around people who try to open their mouth and nothing comes out and it's pretty uncomfortable for not just the person, but for, for you. I never imagined I'd have a career where I communicated for a living. And uh, as I think back about that and now how that's all I do, right? As I communicate and I teach and I train and I lead, that 
it gives me hope that the stuff that I am am poor at now or or my limiting beliefs can be turned into in, into something strong. It can be a strength. And so I, I really believe that that weaknesses can be turned turned into into at least neutral, if not strengths. Mm-hmm. And uh and it helps helps me to to not have limiting beliefs and, and allows me to really be able to focus on um what areas do I need to be great in and how do I um how do I strengthen those things that need to be strengthened? Because we're not we're not stagnant, right? We're very fluid, very dynamic. If we put attention to it, seek out the right mentors, the right coaching, the right help, uh, and and put in the time and the effort that we can really um, again again make something that was weak strong. So so that was something that I've I had. To, in fact, I overcame it twice. Um, quick story: I was I served a two year mission for my church down in Brazil, and uh, while there and learning the, the Portuguese language, I went through the same stuttering problem again, mm-hmm. as if I were a a toddler again, trying to learn how to talk. It was the weirdest thing. I was, I was 19 years old and I'd go to open my mouth and it wasn't just because I didn't know Portuguese. That was the first part. But then as I learned Portuguese, I couldn't, I went right back to stuttering just like I did when I was in grade school. Wow. And uh, so it was obviously very psychological or something was going on there, but I had to work through it twice. And, uh, and it was, there was nothing more humiliating um, and challenging. And yet, very empowering to overcome it. And so I, I carry that with me now as, as a reminder that I can, in fact, this is a family mantra is when my kids are complaining about something, I say, I'm a stoddart and they repeat, I, and I can do hard things. And then I say it again, I'm a stoddart and they say, and we love to do hard things. So <laughs> that's, that's uh, something that we've, we've carried that uh, mantra loud and clear, especially when the groaning starts to set in. <laughs> yeah. Do you have that printed on the wall somewhere? That's a, uh... It's we great don't. you have been repeating that. No, you don't. Wow. That's a great idea. That's a great uh, idea. I got to try that with parenting also. You know, <laughs> we just learned how to give breaks, you know, with our soon to be four year old. That worked fantastically yesterday for me. You know, it was an early morning tantrum, unreasonable tantrum, as I'm sure that you've had in your life uh, yeah. with your children. And uh, we just work toward the break, and the break doesn't start until the tantrum stops. And eventually the tantrum stops, and the break happens. And then break what do you mean like like we're going to go on break like we're going to go do you're something. going on break yeah just say all right i think you're gonna have to take a break right now and then no i don't hmm. want to go on a break no i think you're gonna need a break you know continued screaming for another minute or two and then finally when she calms down say mm-hmm. okay the break's gonna start now then i hit my button on my phone and then count down two minutes you know a minute into it okay we're a minute into it we're halfway there and the whole time during the break she's totally calm waiting for the break to be over i've never seen this ha- like work before but rory told me about it and Works great. Yeah. How am I just learning about this? Like, this is amazing, guys. I <laughs> Raising Lions. That was the book, yeah. right? Raising Lions. Yeah, that's the name of the book. Yes. So yeah. the things you learn on a real estate podcast. I know, right? <laughs> now, uh, now is a break like considered like a timeout? Is that the same thing? Yeah. Like exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Same thing. Take the break exactly where you are. Like you don't go into the corner. You don't go into your bed. You just yeah. take the break. I think you need to take a break right now. Okay, go sit on the floor. Go sit in that chair. We're gonna take a little break. So It'll start as soon as you come down. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as they calm down, like, you know, there could be five minutes of screaming after we declare a break is needed and uh, the break hasn't started yet until you're calm and then the break starts. <laughs> and the ideal time for a break is what? A couple minutes? One or when two minutes. Did. Oh yeah. Just two minutes. Yeah. Um, that actually goes into my final question, which is tell us something you're listening to, watching or reading these days. And clearly we're reading Raising Lions, but what's something that you're listening to <laughs> or watching or reading? You know, I'm actually, uh, Going back through a book that I I read very very carefully and now I'm I'm applying it. It's called a book called called Traction mm-hmm. by Gino Wickman and it it outlines the entrepreneurial operating system. And I think oftentimes when you're an entrepreneur, you're in charge of it all. Mm-hmm. And uh, oftentimes as a result of always working in the business, it's hard to ever work on the business. And I feel like this book gives a framework by which working on the business is no longer a mystery or something that you have to create yourself but it's a plug and play. Here's the system. Here's when you have the meetings. Here's what happens mm-hmm. in the meetings. Um, here's how you find the right people. Here's how you, um, you, you judge their performance. And here's how often you judge their performance. Like it just takes the mystery out of it. And uh, so now I'm going back through because now I'm, I'm a fan of it. So I'm going back through and actually implementing it into my business. Yeah. That's the kind of book that you have to revisit every so often because you will derail from the, the plan every so you have to yeah. revisit it once a year or something like that. No doubt. No doubt. Um, Justin, we'll put all the links to ways to find you in the show notes, but you know, what's the easiest way people could reach out to you if they want more information? You know, I think on my website, if you just go to uh, Justin at think, oh, sorry, just think bigger, 
Um, and then my email address is, is that justin at thinkbiggerre, like real estate, re.com. Justin at thinkbiggerre.com is, again, the, the, the probably best way to, to, to communicate. Or you can go to my website. I've got a number of free resources there. You've got um, access to um, get my book at like for like seven ninety nine. dollars so, um, which is a lot more on Amazon. So yeah, we'd love to hear from you. If this, is re- if this has resonated with you, um, please do reach out. We'd love to see how I can help you apply. Well, it certainly resonated with us. Rory, any final things for Justin? Um, no, I, I, I'm i going to steal a couple of these ideas when I sit down and, and work with my agents because I have a couple agents where I think this would be really critical for myself included. Um, so thank you. And uh, I'll be listening for more tips in your your podcast. I love it. I love it. I look forward to, please circle back and let me know um, how it's working. I'd love to hear the updates and the progress. Yeah. Rory, where can people reach out to you? Um, you can find me at my real estate brokerage. That's Next Home Title Town, nexthometitletown.com, or my law practice, Urban Village Legal, urbanvillagelegal.com. All right. And that's it. Thanks for listening to us at the Real Estate Law Podcast. If you want to reach out to me, you can get me, Jason, at nexthometitletown.com. Uh, I'm happy to pass along any messages to Justin if you don't want to reach out to him directly or you uh, can't get a hold of him for some reason because he's at 17 swim meets, uh, but I'm sure he responds really well to all emails. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give us a great rating. We love five-star reviews on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the platforms that you're listening to this on. Uh, we also read all the comments on YouTube and we read all of our emails. So uh, that's it. Great episode, Justin. Thank you so much for all of your insight and all your time today. Uh, we probably could have gone on for like four more hours because we have so many questions, but um, you know we'll have to uh, have that for the next episode. And thanks for helping uh, decipher some really great ways to uh, improve business in this crazy real estate world that we're all in here in 2023. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks guys for the opportunity. Great show, by the way. Thank Thank you. you. This has been the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. We're powered by Next Home Title Town. Greater Boston's progressive real estate brokerage. More at nexthometitletown.com. And Urban Village Legal, Massachusetts Real Estate Council, serving savvy property owners, lenders, and investors. More at urbanvillagelegal.com. Today's conversation was not legal advice, but we hope you found it entertaining and informative. Discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Thank you for listening.